The title of this session is Mathematics for a Better World. We do remember, I think it was uh, about one and a half years ago or two years ago, uh, a man named Professor Loiso was uh, named the first African mathematician to be elected the uh, vice president of the International Mathematics Union. And that man is here with us. He'll be the moderator to pick us up, uh, to pick up the conversation on how we can make mathematics uh, fit into our plans to have a better world. So Professor Loiso, the floor is all yours. We can't wait for what you have in store. Um, thank you very much, George, uh, for your kind words of um, introduction. Uh, my name is Luis Ononga, and I'm one of the two vice presidents of the International Mathematical Union. Uh, we were, the executive was elected in um, uh, Rio de Janeiro in uh, 2018, and we serve until 2022. I am talking to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good early evening. I am in Johannesburg, and it gives me great pleasure to be uh, moderating this section. Uh, this falls under the uh, general theme of the International Day of Mathematics, and this was declared as... Christian, can I have the slides, please? Yeah. Um, it is one of the major flagship programs of the International Mathematical Union. Um, and was declared or proclaimed by UNESCO. Um, March 14th was proclaimed by UNESCO as the International Day of, Mathem of Mathematics. And the website to find the information is on www.idm314.org. And we just want here to the leadership that was paid by some of the African countries, in particular the Ivory Coast and Ghana. Next slide. Um, this, as I've already pointed out, that uh, this project uh, was championed by the International Mathematical Union, um, of which uh, I'm, I'm one of the two vice presidents. Next slide. Um, the, the question that might be on people's minds is uh, why, ma why ma March the 14th? I think this comes from the fact that a number of uh, countries already ce uh, celebrate Pi Day around the world. And uh, from primary school, when people start working with or introduced to circles, then the constant Pi comes into, is introduced to primary school students. And when you expand that, uh, the first uh, three points is 3.14. So it is the third month and the 14th day, the 14th day of the third month, which is 3.4. Next slide. Uh, the theme for 2021 is mathematics for a better world. And really here, the uh, whole purpose of celebrating uh, or talking about the International Day of Mathematics is to raise awareness about the role of mathematics uh, in contributing to development and innovation and in contributing to uh, addressing some of the challenges of the 21st century, things like climate change, burden of disease, and also the modern developments when people talk about artificial intelligence, the fourth industrial revolution, and so on. So from um, mathematics makes a difference to people across the whole spectrum, from the cradle to the grave. And that is one of the major objectives of uh, this theme of mathematics for a better world. Next slide. Um, the International Day of Mathematics was um, uh, the uh, the the goal was to launch it uh, at the beginning of this year in March this year but as we all know um, a number of countries went into lockdown either the middle of March or from the middle of March or thereabout and it was felt that uh, the event that was going to take place in uh, on the 14th of March was postponed and uh, we felt that we should take advantage of this opportunity uh, to really 
talk a little bit about what we should have done or what we would have done on the 14th of March. Uh, there are countries already celebrating uh, um, mathematics in Africa as or as reflected in on, on that slide on the map. And uh, we hope that more will join uh, in 2021. Next slide. Um, what we would like to, amongst other things, is to involve younger people um, in the activities of celebrating uh, International Mathematics Day, and especially to encourage uh, schools to organize events um, within their communities and in their countries to celebrate this in 2021. And uh, one of the activities that are envisaged is to invite schools that will be participating to draw posters that will organize activities, classroom activities around the International Day of Mathematics. Next slide. Um, we don't know what the future holds with regard to the pandemic that is ravaging uh, all countries, all communities across the world. It could be that we could celebrate this uh, face to face with Gali, or uh, we might have to, uh, because of circumstances, hold a virtual celebration uh, in our respective communities and in our countries. Now for the next IDM uh, in March next year, uh, with a special funding collaboration with the Simons Foundation, uh, we will support three online events uh, in three different African countries uh, where we will show the role of mathematics in addressing contemporary challenges and there would be also be interactive uh, activities aimed at making our world a better world to live in. Next slide. Uh, now what we, are, what we are going to do, if I can just look at the program, is to... Abigail uh, is Invite Abigail Anka to make an announcement about the virtual exhibitions in Africa for the International Day of Mathematics in uh, March 2021. Abigail, over to you. It seems Abigail is not, uh, has maybe left. Okay, maybe. so I can maybe take over for, uh, yeah. this was a satellite activity of uh, the NEF on December 3 to 4. So we are AI, an exhibition on the artificial intelligence. I cannot say much more, but it, it was supposed to be held last March and now it, it was held in December. And the next thing is an announcement of a network, Mathem Africa, so uh, to uh, bring people together who are caring about mathematics in Africa. So look at the URL, and uh, if you are interested, uh, join. Right. Thanks, Christian, for stepping into the breach at short notice. Um, and it's uh, proper and appropriate that you'd be the right person to do so. Uh, and I'm going to invite you to say a few words uh, in about eight to 10 minutes about this theme of mathematics for a better world. I say that Christian is an appropriate person to have stepped in the bridge because as a member of the previous executive of EMU, she was really the champion within the executive of uh, mobilizing countries to support the submission to UNESCO to declare March 14th as the International Day of Mathematics. Over to you, Christian. Okay, so why did, you cho did we choose mathematics for a better world? So what does it mean? Well, one thing that mathematicians are doing is modeling. What is a model? A model is a very drastic simplification of reality, while mathematicians, they like things simple so drastic that all models are wrong but some are useful so why are they useful it's because when you simplify you see the big picture you don't see the tree in the, in the front you see the forest behind 
And you are able to extract the essential features that can be used to manage, to predict, to control. Of course, a model is good if it, if it describes the reality. So we have to validate it with data. And in fact, there is a relatively new technique of data assimilation, so around 1996, which has really been a breakthrough in improving the model's efficiency. So this is something we see in everyday life with weather prediction. So the horizon of prediction has extended from six, seven days to 14 days. And this is beneficial all, all around society, agriculture, crop management, fisheries, and many other things around us. Now we are in the middle of a pandemic and you have certainly heard uh, of it during the NEF and you will hear later. The simplest models for modeling a pandemic bring big lessons to the decision makers. For instance, the kind of things we can measure is the reproduction rate at any time. That means it's the average number of persons that are infected by one infectious individual. If this number is greater than one, so we always have more infected people, and then the epidemic grows. If it's less than one, the epidemic decreases. So a strategy, if you want to control your epidemic, is to bring it to less than one, and you can do by different measures. It could be physical distancing, it could be containment, it could be some vaccines or other methods. Second lesson, the peak of the epidemic. So if you look here, this is the number of people over time that haven't had the disease and this decrease. And then these are the number of infected people at each day. And then you see you have a peak of the epidemic and then the number of infected people decreases. So when you model an epidemic, you want to know what is this peak. For instance, in this model, which, has, which I have taken with no containment measures, no physical distancing, we can have 40% of the population which is simultaneously infected. This is bad. So it's good to be able to predict what will be the height and when the height of the epidemic. These are the people that have recovered. It's lower than the full population. So there is a herd immunity phenomena, which is important for when you want to control the epidemic. For instance, you don't need to vaccinate the whole population to control because of the herd immunity phenomena. Importance of in monitoring an epidemic. So I won't here, I won't describe the thing, but you need to make a lot of tests of people and most of these tests are negative. So it's very expensive for very positive tests. And there are good methods where you mix some samples of individuals to economize of the number, on the number of tests. If, if the mix is negative, you know that all people in the mix or negative. So I want to mention the uh, the breakthrough in this uh, uh, by done by the Rwandan mathematician Winfred uh, Diffon, who recently had an article in Nature on the subject. A new field of computational sustainability. Computational means you, we want to use a lot of data. Suppose you want to draw a poverty map of a country. But if you have no data on the population, how do you do? You have to use data that are unconventional. For instance, you could, there are satellite images that are freely available. You can use them for all regions of the web, uh, of the earth. You can build a neural network that can learn to see what are the infrastructure. If you have big buildings, if you have small houses, if you have roads, etc. So, so you see some uh, infrastructure that are a sign of richness or poverty. And these are the daylight images. And you also have the night light images. And you can compare the daylight images with the night light images. If the night light images have very, very little light, and you know that they are houses, 
that means that there is poverty. So the way you do it is that you build your neural network, you validate it on countries where you have data, and then you can use it to draw poverty maps on countries where you have no data. Tipping points. So why should we care about climate change? Climate is moving, or oh, global change in general. Global uh, changes are occurring very, very slowly. On the other hand, a lesson from mathematics is that a very slow drift can lead to a situation from which return is either very difficult or impossible. So let's take the example of your ball, which is on the left side. And if you move it up the hill, well, it will come back to the equilibrium here. But you see, we have this dangerous point. If we, if the ball comes on the other side, oh, it may fall on this side. And if you have fallen here, then it's very difficult to come back. So it could be a very, very slow movement. But if you don't pay attention, whoops, it's difficult to come back. So these are called the tipping points. Why is it difficult to come back? It's because we have feedback loops that maintain the system in its undesired equilibrium. So you can take the example of sparse vegetation in semi-arid regions. So if you have sparse vegetation, then when there is a little rain, the vegetation makes shadow and it keeps the vegetation in the soil. But when the vegetation has disappeared, then you don't have this feedback loop. And when there is a little rain, it evaporates immediately and then it cannot help to restore the vegetation. So this is a lesson that we should care even to very slow drift. So examples, desertification, shallow lakes, which can pass from clear to turbid and it's difficult to come back, collapse of fisheries, coral reefs when they die, melting of the Arctic ice pack. So this is a large and challenging program for mathematical science in the coming uh, decade to study uh, the resilience of Earth systems. So a system is resilient if it's able to recover after a shock. Why is it a big program? It's now we are in the new digital age where we can uh, use a lot of data that we couldn't use in the past. And it, we hope that it will allow breakthrough in understanding what makes a system resilient. And what is important for decision makers is to in identify the leverage points of the system where it requires the least energy to maintain it in a desired st st state. So for instance, if your ball is just here, a little energy and you can manage to remain on the right side. And if you, you have to, so this is why we hope that it, it will be important to study the resilience. So as a conclusion, the power of mathematical abstraction. Why is it so powerful? Is that the techniques developed from one problems could prove useful for many other similar problems. This is the case for data assimilation. It was developed for weather prediction, but we can have it for many other systems. For optimization or control methods, for uh, methods of artificial intelligence, modeling, etc. So we invite you to celebrate mathematics for a better world in, uh, in 2021. So now we go to Mathematics and Being Human by Kaushal Birka. Christian, um, quickly to uh, just uh, uh, welcome Professor Birka, who's at the University of Cambridge, well known. He is one of the uh, winners of the Fields Medal uh, in 2018. A truly inspirational human being, and uh, we're grateful that you have availed yourself to talk to us this afternoon. And I'm aware of the fact that this year and last year, you availed yourself to present to the young people at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. And uh, we're grateful that you are availed yourself. Over to you. Um, 
Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, hello everyone. Um, I will talk about mathematics and being human in a very general sense. Uh, so I'm not going to show you any pictures or slides. Uh, mathematics has played a really fundamental role in the evolution of civilization, of, of being human. Uh, this started in ancient times. For example, uh, when 4,500 years ago, even more than that, when the Egyptians built those huge pyramids, they used mathematics. That's why they built something so precise. Um, but over the long history of, uh, of written, at least uh, history of, of uh, humankind, uh, we know that mathematics has played a, a really fundamental role uh, because of this, on one hand, because of all the applications of mathematics to making life better on one hand, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the intellectual pursuit of mathematics are something beautiful, are, are something uh, kind of artistic. Uh, so on, in, from both point of views, mathematics has played a really important uh, role, and I want just to make some uh, general remarks about this, um, uh, these issues. Um, so I, as far as I know, you could say that no society in the history of uh, humankind has ever regretted investing in mathematics. So that's the lesson from history and uh, for all of us today, for all the countries in, uh, in this day and age that you cannot really avoid mathematics. Um, otherwise, you will pay a huge uh, price. Uh, first, let me start with uh, talking about the more individual side of on mathematics, how it affects uh, human beings on an individual personal level. This is more related to the intellectual side of uh, mathematics and being a mathematician. And this is uh, basically more related, maybe you could say, to the pure side of mathematics. In the world of pure mathematics, research is primarily driven by curiosity. That means we like to understand mathematics, we like to understand a certain structure in mathematics, we like to unlock its mysteries and its beauty, and that's the primary driving force for someone like me to do mathematics. Um, but history says that even the most abstract kind of mathematics will eventually uh, quite often find real world applications, somehow application in other sciences or uh, even uh, daily life. So, so it's really important to invest in this kind of intellectual pursuit because it has, uh, uh, it has meaning for uh, the individual who is doing the mathematics. Uh, mathematics has a lot of uh, very interesting and attractive characteristics. Uh, one of those characteristics is that uh, it's very precise is unlike any other kind of uh, knowledge or um, scientific discipline, because whatever you say, it should be proved precisely. And once it's proved precisely and correctly, it will remain forever. So it will be uh, immortal. Uh, but that's not the case even in the closest sciences uh, to mathematics. For example, in physics, uh, if you say something now, it may be changed uh, a decade or I don't know, 50 years later, because a new theory comes to explain uh, the real world and uh, the old one might be forgotten. But, but that's not the case in mathematics. It will stay forever. Whatever people proved 2000 years ago, it is still relevant and it is still uh, okay as long as it's correct. Another characteristic of mathematics is that it's beautiful, but in a sense that may not be uh, always visual. Uh, we humans all have a good understanding of visual beauty. If someone tells you that a flower is beautiful, it's not difficult, difficult to understand uh, why it is beautiful, just um, because of its colors, how the colors uh, blend and so on. Even a child can easily appreciate that a flower is beautiful. Uh, but for a scientist and for a mathematician, we like to go in uh, deeper and, and, and understand and discover inner beauty. Uh, so again, in the example of the flower, for a scientist, uh, they may try to understand how the flower uh, is created in the first place, how it survives, how it gray, uh, grows, how it gets energy, uh, for, for example, from the sun 
uh, where the energy actually goes into the leaf and then from the leaves goes into the flower and so on. And how uh, the, the flower itself, how it makes color, how do we perceive color? And all these things, uh, one can go uh, deep into this subject and study. It. Uh, this is, uh, you could say, similar to how we do mathematics. We like to unlock, uh, to see the beauties which are not always visual, but something that only exists in the mind. So that's why uh, we still call it beauty, but it's just a different kind of uh, beauty. Another characteristic of mathematics is that it's universal. It doesn't belong to a particular culture. It has existed in so many different cultures around the world, from the Mesopotamians to Egyptians to Chinese, Indian, and Western societies, of course. And today is spreading uh, basically everywhere. So that's also another good thing about mathematics. And in general, for someone like me, mathematics is challenging and really exciting. And that's one of the reasons that I like to do mathematics, even if I don't pay attention at all to applications of mathematics. So in general, mathematics makes life enjoyable and makes life meaningful. Not only enjoyable in a superficial sense, but it actually gives meaning to the life of the person who is doing the mathematics. So now you imagine that there are thousands and thousands of people around the world who do research in <coughs> mathematics and they get meaning. They make their lives meaningful because of doing this, because of this pursuit, intellectual pursuit of uh, mathematics, and I think that's really worth investment because uh, for humans to survive, it's important that they make sense of their life. Somehow they make their life uh, meaningful. Different people do it in different ways, for, but for mathematicians and generally for scientists, it's quite often just uh, the pursuit of intellectual activity that makes their lives meaningful, and I think we, it, this is quite worth uh, investing in general uh, everywhere in the world. Um, and being a mathematician also makes uh, that it, it creates community so that you belong to a certain uh, community and then you feel that you belong a certain uh, group of uh, mathematicians and generally scientists. Uh, so again, that makes your life somehow more uh, meaningful and that's quite important. And as I uh, mentioned before, uh, even the most abstract part of mathematics quite often find applications uh, to physics, for example, or to computer science or, or something. So we should not worry about investing in even the most abstract kind of mathematics because even if it doesn't find any application, it still has value. And that's important. We need to somehow create uh, this value in societies that maybe they don't have a long history of mathematics. So that's the personal and individual side of uh, being a mathematician, but there is also a more general side, uh, the more uh, useful or ap applied side of mathematics. Uh, mathematics, as uh, uh, in this a few minutes, you uh, saw Christian and other explained, mathematics is very useful for understanding the world. It's basically, the, as the people say, the language of science. It's a fundamental tool for understanding the world, for understanding nature, for even understanding uh, the very uh, life of uh, humans themselves. Uh, for example, mathematics is used in physics, it's used in chemistry, it's used in biology, it's used in medicine, in healthcare, in engineering, in computer science, in economics, in climate and weather understanding, and uh, pretty much everything. Really, you cannot almost do any kind of science without mathematics. So either mathematics is directly involved or indirectly somehow mathematics is involved in understanding some natural uh, phenomena. Uh, so one of the examples Christian discussed was the uh, understanding pandemics, for example, like the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, there is a mathematical model for that. So usually if you want to understand something in nature, you make a mathematical model, you make some kind of uh, derive, extract some abstract uh, concepts from that. From your ob observations, you make a model and you try to get in information, to understand uh, the system using that model. And then uh, eventually you would like to predict what happens next. So there is understanding on one side and you want also to predict what will happen. Uh, this is, of course, uh, 
relevant to many things, for, for example, economics. You want to, uh, uh, to have a healthy e economy, you want to predict what will happen in the next few months or in the next few years. And mathematics is fundamental for all these kind of uh, predictions. Uh, in general, mathematics is fundamental for solving human-related problems. Um, for example, healthcare, or I don't know, it, there are so many different ways that mathematics can affect uh, the society. And I think it's really important for governments to invest in mathematics. For example, they can direct uh, mathematical research to solve a specific problem in their country, whether that's related to health and medicine or it's related to economics or related to education or whatever mathematics is likely to uh, have an impact. And uh, this is actually quite also important for uh, the developing world. Um, as I said, there is an individual intellectual side of mathematics that sh we should invest in that anyway. But uh, the applied side also, we should somehow connect um, mathematics to problems that exist in a specific country or region. Uh, so if you do applied mathematics in a specific country, which has uh, maybe nothing to do with the problems in that particular country, then um, it's still a value, of course, but maybe resources should be directed toward problems that actually exist and solutions are uh, sought uh, after. Uh, mathematics is not only just in huge scale um, system, but also in everybody's uh, everyday life. For example, almost everyone now around the world is using a phone, a mobile phone, or they use a computer. Uh, but they probably don't know that uh, hundreds of years of mathematics has gone into making a mobile phone. Because a phone, mobile phone has so many different uh, components. The way that it has to communicate with, uh, from your phone to other phones, it has to go through a whole network. Uh, a lot of mathematics is used. Uh, not only mathematics, but other sciences and engineering, but there is a huge amount of mathematics. Uh, so people use mathematics all the time, but uh, maybe they don't even notice that there is a mathematics. In general, there is a strong connection also between pure and applied mathematics in the sense that uh, quite often there is a problem uh, in nature or in society is formulated into, in terms of a mathematical model. And then finally that uh, problem or some modified version of the problem ends up in pure mathematics. Pure mathematicians may think about it for decades and even sometimes for a century, and then even maybe they forget about where the problem came from. And then finally, quite often, the same set of ideas go back to find applications in nature. So I think then it's really worth investing in both pure and applied side of uh, mathematics. And the natural question, of course, is for societies, for countries where there is a not a long history of mathematics, how to create a culture of mathematics and how to actually create mathematicians. Uh, well, one important point is that this is a long-term process. There is no quick, quick way to do that. Uh, so patience is really very important. And this is also related to politics in the sense that quite often uh, governments are uh, formed by political parties, they are in power for like four years and they want to see immediate quick results. Or they, when they come to power, maybe they change everything that the previous government did, and that's not good. You need a kind of long-term program independent of political parties in power. Uh, so there is no easy, quick way to do mathematics. This is a long-term process. You may need like 20 years before you see the, the fruits. Um, so in general, we need to invest in education from primary school to research level. Uh, for example, um, maybe it's, it's usually difficult to like change a whole system in a whole country, but maybe one can start from small scale. Like in each city, one can have a model school, uh, do something, experiments there, and then finally that becomes a model and spreads uh, around. Uh, for higher levels like PhD, is, that's more complicated. Uh, the obvious way to do it is to send uh, good students abroad to study in a good university and then come back finally to uh, create something in your uh, own country. Um, another important aspect of 
uh, creating this culture of mathematics is that uh, you need to have job prospect for mathematicians, for people who graduate, uh, who do like PhD in mathematics. Uh, if students in your country think that they will have no chance of getting a job if they become a mathematician, then obviously they will not have um, motivation to do mathematics or science in general. So creating jobs is really, really important. They should somehow be given the uh, the idea that they will end up, at least they will have a reasonable chance of uh, having jobs in the end after spending uh, a lot of years, because to become a researcher in mathematics or, or any other field is a very heavy investment. One has to spend like a long um, time, many, many years before one can get a job. And if people think that they will not even get a job, either they will just not come back to your country or they will not even uh, follow research in mathematics or science in general. Um, another important point is funding. To create a mathematical and scientific culture, you need funding, of course, to improve education and to do research uh, and so on. Um, another point is uh, media. Media can be used to popularize mathematics and even create mathematical heroes. Um, so you see that there is a lot of attention given to sports, for example. Uh, a good football player in your country may immediately become a hero. Uh, but that's usually not the case for science and for mathematics, but it's actually possible to do. If you have like extremely good students or mathematicians, you can just um, popularize them, let people know them that there are these people so that they become example and motivation for the younger generation. Uh, in general, one has to somehow create a value in the society. And this is difficult if there is no history of mathematics in a particular society. One has to create the, the, the value that doing mathematics is of value itself, whether it has applications or not. But uh, if it has applications, that's even better. So I think there are a, a lot of challenges in creating a mathematical culture, but it's not impossible. It definitely is possible especially on a small scale, it really is possible. It can be done in almost any country with some reasonable support and some reasonable uh, stability. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bika, for your inspirational talk, especially uh, with uh, all the younger people who aspire to uh, the mathematical leaders in their countries and also contribute in the way that you have. There's time maybe for one or two minutes, I mean for one, for one or two questions or comments from the audience before we, uh, we move on to the next speaker. I see one comment. Being human, does mathematics help being honest? Um, that's a difficult question, actually. In general, you can ask uh, whether mathematics actually makes people more, uh, maybe behave better or not. I think it has some effect, but there is also a lot of other factors that uh, that affects uh, a human behavior. For example, the, the particular culture one lives in also has a lot of effect on how uh, people behave. But I think in general, I would say yes, mathematics has a positive impact on how people behave. I mean, at the very least, it makes us very busy, so we don't have time to go out and do something uh, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I think it's more fundamental than that. <laughs> I will now invite the next speaker, Dr. Aisha Walcott Bryant, uh, who will talk to us about AI for disease intervention planning for a maximum of 10 minutes. Uh, Aisha? Yes, uh, once they share the slides, I can get started. Great. So um, I'm Aisha Walcott Bryant. Um, I am a research scientist and a manager here at IBM Research Africa, uh, based out of Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about I think you saw on Christian's slides about how math um, contributes to AI and even control control systems. So we'll have elements of that in the talk. Next slide. Great. So the problem I'll focus on, and uh, along with my 
colleagues today will be on a mal malaria eradication. So we all might know, or maybe, maybe we don't, that every 30 seconds, one child dies from malaria uh, globally. And malaria uh, cases occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. About 90% of the cases are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And more than 400,000 people died from malaria in 2018 alone. But I think what's so important here is even though the parasite has been around since so-called prehistoric times and has been known to be in all continents of the world except perhaps Antarctica and has been uh, eliminated along many of those continents as well, it's still very uh, endemic in, in, in African countries. It can be, however, treated with anti-malarial drugs and the transmission of the disease can be prevented with effective malaria control. Next slide. So as we think about effective malaria control from an AI perspective, we think about the problem in which a policymaker or decision maker, perhaps an, um, you know, that's working on national malaria control programs, needs to be able to reach specific targets uh, for the disease control. It can be a reduction in mortality, eradicate the disease in, in their country, uh, reduce the prevalence, um, and these uh, decision makers, they all have constraints, um, as we all know. Um, it can be budget constraints, it could be uh, around the supplies and so forth. So imagine you're a policymaker, you need to determine which interventions do you deploy at which point in time across which populations um, that you are you know, uh, uh, leading or governing over uh, to, to meet these targets. So you've got constraints of a system, you've got your goals, which are disease targets, and you've got these levers, which are interventions that you can pull. Um, and these levers can be your spraying um, um, different households and buildings, and it can also be distributing, uh, uh, distributing mosquito nets. Now, at the same time, there is a long and rich uh, community of malaria modelers. And so there are many different malaria models out there and they're very complicated um, and they can be difficult to access if you're a policymaker. It's a different you know, set of expertise. So what our aim is really to um, be able to use AI to access these complex models which, which represent a huge space of all possible interventions that can be done in a certain location look through that space, find the feasible sets of interventions, and um, provide those back to decision makers. Next slide. Great. So while these models might be complex, as it turns out that even though they are, um, they represent a, a broad space of po uh, possibilities, uh, nearly infinite, it's actually well suited for AI problems. So there's a, quite a bit of work in AI search methods um, in, in, in a subfield of machine learning called reinforcement learning, and even in optimization and control that actually can be leveraged for these types of problems. So it's, there's something uh, beautiful from a mathematical and fundamental uh, uh, modeling perspective that allows AI to come together and provide additional value to um, the malaria control community by leveraging existing uh, malaria intervention models. Next slide. So here's an example of one, um, uh, some of the early work that we've actually done in this space. So we took an existing model from Open Malaria, it's an open source uh, malaria model, and we applied um, uh, a reward function. You know, we wanted to reduce the disability adjusted life years. We wanted to, um, that, our, that the population could be impacted by if they, if they get a malaria. And we looked at an action space just of, uh, of spraying and of nets. So the x-axis shows um, net coverage. So it'll say the percentage of population uh, that has nets. So it could be from 0% of the population all the way up to 100%. And the y-axis is um, the percentage of, of, of the population for which their households or different uh, uh, institutions uh, had spraying. Now, what we found from this work, so the, the, the red dots here show us sampling the models. Um, 
using different AI methods to explore the models. Um, so every time you enter any type of, any combination of interventions, you project by running these models as a simulation, the future state of the world. And you want to project the future state of the world because you want to say, well, which combination of interventions can actually help me meet my goal? And in this case, we use methods called multi-armed bandit methods. And this is basically uh, allowing you to do kind of like a one-shot set of examples. So if you wanted to do malaria policy and just define what is the intervention package for, that we will apply for the next two, three years, this is a method to find uh, the optimal solution that meets those goals. And this work, uh, you, you can uh, see the publication as well. Now on the next slide, we've extended this notion of looking at a policy that you apply for one period of time into basically adapting policies. So over, let's say five, five years, you could do a specific set of interventions for six months, another set of interventions for three months and so forth. So you have this flexibility of sequential decision-making um, that's at the disposal for the for the policymaker in, in terms of reaching their goal. And this is kind of a different way of thinking because usually and traditionally malaria um, control programs are, they basically say, we're gonna do X for this amount of time. So in this way, we can actually plan um, and have plans that are a bit more dynamic where you can do different types of interventions over time and meet your target. And what's beautiful about this work is that we have actually shown by doing this sort of, let's say, multi-step decision-making using reinforcement learning, the orange curve shows you, um, shows you those that were generated using this multi-step method, and the blue curve shows you uh, the different um, possi possible interventions um, using the single-step method. And then the red line shows you where you want to be in terms of your your goal, your target, in this case being prevalence. So as it turns out, this sequential decision-making process, the orange dot, actually much more quickly reaches, um, reaches the target and it reaches it with uh, a less cost than the single intervention program. So it now shows that, in that using these AI methods, we actually can find a cost-effective plan that's that allows for some adaptation and flexibility over a period of time that also meets the constraints of budget. So this is just an example of the potential. Next slide. So this work that we've been doing, we're also collaborating closely with uh, the Uganda NMCP to test these concepts. So these concepts of leveraging AI, interacting and engaging with the existing malaria model, modeling community, and interacting and engaging with the uh, policymakers um, to come together to make uh, to make to help them make better decisions around malaria control and to meet their target. And in this case, um, the goal for uh, for Uganda is to generate new malaria intervention programs that will reduce the prevalence and minimize deaths. So that's two two targets, two objectives. So you can call it like a multi-objective uh, function. And the goal is to do that by 2025, drive the malaria parasite prevalence in all, and I think there's more than 134 districts now, but in all 134 districts of Uganda to 5% or less. And why is that super complicated, but at the same time, well uh, suited for AI? Because every single district in Uganda has a different scenario and a different environment when it comes to malaria in terms of how many people have been uh, infected, uh, you know, the environment itself for the parasite. So this is a problem in which... Yes. If you can just wrap up, uh, running right. out of time. Thanks. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's my last oh, okay. slide. So this is just a very, very important problem for where uh, uh, AI can be applied. And next slide. This is just showing the team. Um, so I want to thank the, the teammates that I have across the IBM Research Labs. And thank you all very much. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk on applications of AI to uh, managing malaria intervention. Thank you for this. I'm sorry about.
or happened before. So in the next few five minutes, I want to give highlights from the conference via AI and introduce a very interesting um, platform or blog, Mathemafrica. The We Are AI conference was organized by AIMS and QLA in partnership with Imaginary to create an awareness into the world of AI with a target group of students, researchers, and general public. The aim was to highlight the advancement in terms of applications and technologies in diverse sectors by scientists in research, academia, and society. So we had interesting discussions from AI and politics to applications to um, space-borne remote sensing data. We also saw the application of AI in the areas of viticulture, drug discovery, real estate, and art. We also saw through some presentations challenges in terms of education, acquisition of local data for training AI models, and AI startups in Africa. We had introductory, introductory sessions to basic AI concepts, and we also had fun interactive sections with games and digital exhibits. And um, the hosts for this program, Dr. Andreas and Dr. Rosita, did a good job at making sure that the conference went well. On the whole, we can say the AI conference was a success, and we will invite everyone to participate in the next session organized. Next slide, please. So next, I want to talk about mathemafrica.org. Someone asked the question, where can you find the best resources for self-made mathematicians? I would recommend this um, platform. It is a multi-language open blogging platform for all researchers or anyone with a connection to mathematical science to write and share ideas. When you visit the site, you find introductory topics, lectures, and blogs in mathematics and AI. This blogging platform has been created for the continent. And we hope to extend this platform so that it serves as a net, um, so that it's, it can be useful for networking in the, such that um, research project ideas and concerns can be shared on this platform. So if you're interested as a contributor, you can visit the platform and send an email. Jonathan Shock has done an amazing job to keep this platform alive. And we would want you all to help spread the awareness of this platform and make put to use the resources available there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was Abigail. We can try and draw this uh, wonderful session to an end. And uh, thank all the organizers of the session and people who thought about putting this together uh, to thank the um, speakers that we conducted in some instances at short notice who availed themselves to come and share their thoughts and experiences and advice on how we can uh, lift up the image of mathematics in our communities, especially in, um, in, in Africa. And uh, to all people who connected, um, thank you very much for your time. And we hope that you will start immediately with your preparations for the activities of 2021 to celebrate uh, mathematics and the International Day of Mathematics. I wonder if there's a cl some closing comments from uh, the overall chair. Well, spread the world. Mathe uh, spread the word mathematics for a better world spread it around uh, around you and uh, have the schools celebrate in 2021 each school should celebrate the pandemic is not an obstacle to celebrate in the classroom thank you thank you all and uh, goodbye thanks bye thank you thank you very much Thank you, Professor Luiso. We, we want to do something, actually. We want to do something interesting because the next session starts at 2.30 and we have just about three minutes to get everyone's participation on this. Can everyone just uh, comment with one word, maybe, 
how maths has has what just one area where maths has has helped them whether it's the most complicated stuff like robotics or groceries or making sure you budget properly can someone can you can you just write how maths has helped you let me let me just start <laughs> And if it is finance, all right. Someone says finance. You could write as well, Prof. Aside from you know, being, uh, <laughs> yeah, budget and modeling, gene regulation. This is this is this yeah. This is nice. Let's see how diverse we're gonna get. Okay. Can you see the answers coming in? No, I, I don't have I don't have five of them from my side. Electrical oh, engineering, project management, self discipline, playing pool, <laughs> pricing financial products, uh, stocking fish and stock assignments. Okay, fantastic. So, the prof, you're definitely in the right space as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much. We can't thank you enough um, uh, for, for allowing us to jump into your mind a bit. Uh, Professor Korsha, Professor Christian, thank you as well. Thank you as well for that. Uh, Dr. Aisha and Abigail, thank you very, very much for allowing us to, to just, you know, just hear a bit more on how uh, we're creating a very practical world even as we try to make it better. Thanks. So what's going to happen? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish you could applaud. But virtually, all we have to do is put emojis. You know? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. So what's going to happen now? We have uh, the next Einstein Forum a Fellows Spotlight Session 4. So please, it's time already. Let's leave this room again. Go to the sessions. And then we'll go to the sessions where you'll see a NEF Fellows. And then there is where we'll see the class of 2019 to 2021 the fourth session on how they are impacting the communities and the world at large. So please, let's all just transition to sessions. Thanks a lot. Thank you.